Paoli dropped into an underworld of drugs, prostitution, and alcohol. The more he drank, the more obnoxious he became. Uh, he was often thrown out of a bar, which was a mixed blessing, because sometimes he got into a brawl and was beaten up. He was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and to make matters worse, he had trouble in, in relations with women uh, with anything uh, besides sex. As he wrote to his good friend Gregor Wenzel, the physicist, in 1926, I have noticed that wine agrees very well with me. After the second bottle of wine or champagne, I usually adopt the manners of a good companion, which I never have in a sober state, <laughs> and then may under these circumstances enormously impress the surroundings, particularly if they are women. <laughs> now, in, in the fall of 1927, a, a, a calamitous event occurred in Pauli's life. His beloved mother committed suicide. His famous father, the chemist Wolfgang Sr., uh, ever the womanized, at this time had gone too far and left his wife for a woman his son's age, and this was too much for her. Ever the great compartmentalizer, Wolfgang Jr., instead of talking about his distress to friends and colleagues, buried himself deeper into his work. Um, luckily, the following year, 1928, the call came from the ETH in Zurich for a professorship, giving Pauli uh, a new lease on life. Some years later, he recalled to Jung how he left Hamburg and traveled towards my new professorship and my big neurosis, as if he didn't have one already. <laughs> what happened was that in 1927, Peter de Bayer decided to leave the ETH and go to Leipzig. Uh, the first choice for the job was actually Werner Heisenberg, but Heisenberg decided to stay in Germany, and he was lured anyway by, by, uh, by the buyer. Pauli was the second choice. Despite his brilliant research, uh, there were some questions about his teaching, which has been often described as a soliloquy in which he faced the blackboard, and his students could see the great man struggling with a fundamental point in physics. So only the very best students got anything out of his courses. The authorities at the ETH figured that he was young enough uh, to change, and so, in April 1928, he uh, entered the physics building at number five, Gloria Strasse, and began a, what would be his 30-year career. Uh, socially, he did quite well at Zurich. He um, availed himself of leisure activities. Here he is bathing at the Strandbad, a beach uh, uh, about 10 or 20 minutes drive from, from the city. And he had two good friends that when he first came to uh, Zurich. Uh, they were his uh, assistant, uh, his first assistant, Ralph Kronig, and Paul Scherer, longtime head of the physics department who had a, with whom Pauli had a very complex relationship. And one could imagine that these three pals uh, going swimming during the day and then eating at the Kronenhaller in the evening and then on a warm June night sitting in the Cafe Terrasse and penning a letter to their good friend, PQ minus QP Jordan, <laughs> Pasquale Jordan, as they, as they called him. We're about to study the Zurich nightlife and try to improve it following the new method due to Pauli. By comparison, many greetings, Kronig. The method, however, may also be used to worsen matters. Greetings, Pauli. I, too, have heard so many bad things about you that I would like to meet you, Shera. And Pauli surrounded himself with lots of young physicists besides Kronig, Felix Bloch, I.I. I. Robbie, R.E. Pyros, and here is uh, Pauli, Robbie and, Oppen and Stella Postdoc, such as J. Robin Oppenheimer, and the three sailing on Lake Zurich in the summer of 1929. Pauli felt somewhat attracted to Oppenheimer. Uh, perhaps he saw in Oppenheimer a reflection of his own tortured personality. Now, in, in the spirit of his favorite philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, Pauli considered marriage to be a bourgeois waste of time. So everybody was amazed that in 1929 he married Katie Deppner a cabaret dancer whom we had met in one of his many jaunts into the fetid demi monde of Berlin. And here's the happy couple walking in the hills around outside of uh, Zurich. Pauli does not have a sardonic smile on his face, and uh, he looks happy in his arm as in, as in Katie's. And suffice it to say, it was a mismatch. It lasted less than a year. Uh, Pauli's scientific creativity never flagged. A month after he was divorced, in December 1930, he audaciously proposed the existence of a new elementary particle, which came to be called a neutrino, in order to save the law of conservation of energy in beta decay. That it was extraordinary that at a time of such great personal stress, 
uh, Pauli could come up with a suggestion of such cosmic importance, he was truly a great compartmentalizer. He spent the summer of 1931 traveling across the United States speaking on his new particle. Here he is at uh, Caltech looking happy. Uh, uh, meanwhile, his trademark cynical comments were becoming more frequent and gendering further resentment from their targets. Comments such as, why that's not even wrong, so young and so unknown, and you're more interesting drunk than sober. <laughs> and indeed, Pauli was drinking to excess. At the end of the summer, he managed to fall down a flight of stairs that, during a summer school at Ann Arbor in Michigan and break his arm. Uh, he revealed his true state of mind uh, once more to Wenzel. With women and me, things don't work out at all and probably never will succeed again. This I am afraid I have to live with, but it is not always easy. I am somewhat afraid that in getting older, I will feel increasingly lonely. The eternal soliloquy is so tiresome. Indeed, Pauli had, had resumed his life of uh, drinking and barroom brawling, and eventually the authorities at the Ete Ha uh, heard about the, the, his bitter quarrels with colleagues, placing his uh, uh, position in some jeopardy despite his brilliant results in physics. Once again, he was leading two separate lives, and to make matters worse, his, his, his vivid, as he called it, ecstasies and visions were seeping into his, his waking life. In the beginning of, uh, in January 1932, his situation had become critical, and he decided to take his father's advice, despite the fact that he hated him, to consult uh, the celebrated psychologist Carl Jung, who, at 57 years of age, was at the height of his fame. Now, unlike uh, uh, Freud, Jung was interested in those aspects of the psyche that could not be attributed to an individual's personal development, but to deeper non-personal realms common to humankind, the collective unconscious, whose contents Jung called archetypes. Archetypes are latent potentialities whose origins remain forever unknown because they reside in the shadowy, mysterious world of the collective unconscious, but they can be energized so as to work themselves up and bubble up into consciousness as archetypal images or symbols, and in this way affect our feelings, thoughts, and actions. Um, to his amazement, Jung found that his patients were producing symbols that were akin to symbols in, in, esoteric, in esoteric sex, esoteric cults, as well as in alchemy, um, branches of knowledge that most people considered, <coughs> considered as rubbish, but not Jung. And in particular, most important to Jung was the mandala symbol. Jung found that it existed in cultures across the globe and into deep history. The mandala could be a circle, it could be a square, but it was characterized by four objects symmetrically placed. Why four, Jung didn't know early on when he was framing his analytic psychology. He knew that four was a magic number in the sense that, uh, is a mythical number in the sense that there were, for example, four basic elements in Aristotelian science, earth, water, air, and fire, four seasons, four cardinal points of the compass, four rivers of paradise, and so on. And upon achieving stability and inner harmony after deep bouts of deep depression, Jung also found that his patients uh, uh, usually, almost always, produced, produced mandalas. Now, before going to see Jung, uh, Pauli decided, uh, being Pauli, decided to read up on Jung's psychology. And uh, Pauli's books are in La Salle Pauli, if you care to take a look at it. And uh, Pauli focused on Jung's uh, book, 1921 book, Psychological Types, in which Jung set a vocabulary and a framework for his developing analytic psychology. He offered a topology of the mind based on two types an extrovert and an introvert with some fine structure in four basic functions taken two at a time, thinking and feeling and intuition and sensation. Once again, why four, Jung still didn't realize at this time. It just seemed to emerge from his patients. Now the dominating functions give each individual their own psychology. So uh, people who are, who are thinking sorts devote most of their conscious energy to thinking at the expense of the feeling function, which becomes the inferior function. And in extreme circumstances, the feeling function can drop deep into the unconscious and revert to its earlier archaic state.